This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hello and welcome to The Art of Thinking Smart. We're in the studios of Think Tech here in beautiful downtown Honolulu. And we have a very interesting guest with us today. And in this program, what we try to do is capture successful people in full stride for half an hour and consider, take a step back from the details of what they're actually doing into the substance of why they're doing it, how they're doing it, and where it goes. So the art of thinking smart is being able to think two or three steps ahead and maybe even think all the way through your entire identity and your career. So there are proven techniques and habits that successful people have that allows them to execute their vision effectively on a day-to-day -day basis. And we have uh, Chris Miller here who's had a long career in high technology and media and spends a good deal amount, uh, a good deal of time advising individuals and organizations on how to be effective. So he's an excellent person to tell us how are you effective, Chris? What makes you effective in your profession? Well, I think I've been really fortunate to get access to tools to help me know myself pretty well. And early on, I took a Strength Finders test. You might be familiar with Strength Finders. Mm -hmm. And I found that in my technology business, I had set myself up around my strengths. I was optimizing my nature, optimizing my strengths on automatically. And I think that's one of the real things that really helps people. I found that so many people, they're living their lives according to values outside their nature, and that that really gets in the way. Mm. So, so what is the Strength Finder? How can people access that? How can they learn more about it? Well, Strength Finders is probably one of the most successful business testing assessments mm. uh, out there. Uh, it was a book of the year uh, in the early 2000s, and it's an assessment of what optimizes you. So if we Google it, we can find out about the test and maybe take the test to That's right. online or something? Strengthfinders.com. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so, so give us an example, like what, what were your strengths that you were optimized around that this test detected? Well, you, you uh, take a test that's going to, in about 30 minutes, tell you your top five strengths. Now, I've expanded upon it, but uh, the, uh, the Gartner Group did an assessment of strengths and through maybe two or three million people that they assessed. And they found that we all have some 32 strengths that are, you know, some, some of them surprising. Like my first strength is connection. I didn't even know connectedness was a strength. Mm -hmm. So I look at and understand and relate to people uh, according to how we are all related. I see the relationship between all things, for instance. Uh, I have a knowing that everything happens for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at people, I'm a connector to other people. I tend to look at how to uh, relate and understand the people based upon who they are. Mm -hmm. My other strengths are uh, strategy, responsibility, uh, maximize, I know how to maximize other people's strengths and uh, ideas. So I suppose by inference, this test will also reveal your weaknesses and things that you shouldn't center yourself around. No, not at all, actually. No, but yeah. the number 32 on the list would presumably be weaker than the number one on the list. Well, that's correct. It, and I've taken, you can spend more money and find out where all those strengths lie. Uh -huh. But uh, the conventional wisdom now is focus on your strengths and forget your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Because, for instance, if you have someone that loves doing something that's not your strength, they will naturally do far better than you. You can't ever even hope to come close mm -hmm. to their capacity by doing what they're doing. And so why not focus on those things that you have the, the greatest capacity to succeed with? So do you implement that approach in the groups and businesses that you work with? Frequently. Uh, with my teams and anybody I'm doing a lot of work with, I tend to ask for them to take the test mm -hmm. because then I understand where they're going to naturally Excel, mm -hmm. and uh, and that's just one aspect. I think that as we know ourselves, and we know what we like, and we know what we would just love doing no matter what. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just about oh I you know I make a lot of money doing this. It's what do I really 
have time just disappear doing. Right. Like if I'm in love doing something, then you know I'm in joy. Mm -hmm. And so, and it's really been found that um, if you look at innovation, for instance, where I happen to really like to play, uh, the innovators tend to be more connected to what they're doing, mm -hmm. rather than to a certain type of outcome that's going to give them a certain kind of experience. Mm -hmm. So give us a little microscope into the life of Chris Miller. One thing that we've found in the course of doing many programs like this mm -hmm. is that successful people have a view of their day. When they rise, when they move, when they lunch, when they work and dinner and so on, there's a kind of a rhythm, there's a set yeah. of habits, which of course may vary according to circumstance. Yes. But what is, the, what is the template of an ideal day for Chris Miller? How do, you, how do you begin and how do you end? Well, I'm a morning person, and so I have a whole bunch of morning practices that you know, have to do with self-care and, uh, and kind of moving towards greater consciousness. I want to learn how to be as present as I can be. In fact, uh, one of the things I said to a, a teacher of mine recently was, I'd like to live a story-free life. Meaning, I want to be so present with life that I'm not in my mind about it. I'm able to be really, really here mm. in the moment. And so a lot of what I'm doing has to do with self-care practices that keep me from being overly full. Mm -hmm. Like, as you saw me arrive, being rather flustered, having a hard time getting here. Mm -hmm. How do I get reconnected to now and to being so present mm -hmm. that all the other mind stuff goes away? And the more present I am, the more capacity I have to really... So how do you do that present centering thing? Is there a breath? Is there a visualization? A posture? Well, it's a, it's a number of things for me. So um, I have practices around gratitude. I have practices around uh, releasing uh, what I'm holding. I have practices around um, really becoming centered. Mm -hmm. I use nature. I use music. I use breath. I use a variety of things. And all I know forgiveness is one of the things that you do, and we have a, a shot of the, the uh, homepage of the Hawaii Forgiveness Project. Yes. And you were instrumental in helping to produce the annual Forgiveness Festival this, just this past weekend. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us a little bit about forgiveness and how that works into, let's say, a business process. There's, there's a company, mm -hmm. does it need to, and the people in it, do they need to incorporate forgiveness in order to be effective? Well, I found that forgiveness is not really recognized fully for what it is. Like my capacity to be, to be present is really a, a statement of how much forgiveness I have. So if I can't be present, I'm resisting something. And if I'm resisting something, mm -hmm. there's something to forgive, mm -hmm. okay? So, and that might be my expectations of myself, my interpretation of life. Mm. So I see forgiveness as being a, a, a tool to really help me understand uh, what's going on in my own head and heart and mm. what can I do to get more present. So this morning, for example, you were delayed by some other people who didn't do things that they were supposed to do at the time that they were supposed to, and you were coming in a few minutes late to the studio. Yes. You had to forgive them right? Yes. In order to come and sit and be centered here, you couldn't dwell on the fact that oh, they're saying this stuff and they caused me to be late at tents. Well, I have practices around judgment, for instance, oh. that also help. Like anything that I'm judging is a statement for me of a, a shadow self issue. Mm -hmm. So if I, for instance, had a judgment about the people that were late this morning, that's really reflecting a part of myself I don't like. If uh, that makes how sense. does that work? Well, I'll give you an example. I, I was, I've been teaching uh, nonviolent communication for about 10 years. Right. And, um, we have a slate on that too, about that organization. Yeah. You can have a look at that while you speak. And I use all these tools and technology in my technology business around organizational development because it, they're all tools, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, there was a woman that was coming to a practice group I was leading and I really couldn't stand her. She come into the room in 10 minutes and was like, please, God, get me out of here. <laughs> And she really pushed my buttons. And I came to recognize that it wasn't about her. She was reflecting my inner life issues. Oh. She was reflecting the things about myself I didn't like and, and I was projecting them back. She was a mirror for me. Mm. 
So what I did was I spent time, and this was something that I learned from Marshall Rosenberg around uh, judgment and releasing the judgments. And it took me probably a couple hours associated with her. Then I tested it. This woman's a therapist. I uh, taught three classes with her. And people were so surprised at how I could connect with her. She didn't bother me at all. They actually thought I was in relationship with her because I could tease her. Mm. Uh, it was really quite fun. I could mm. say things, she turned crimson red. Mm. And so she was a great teaching vehicle for me. So and you were able to release that shadow that you had with her. That's right. right, that's right. And so whenever I have something going on, I still have judgments I get to work on. Yeah. Uh, you know, then it's an opportunity for me to clear myself of those right. judgments and it's like I reclaim a, a piece of my own but spirit. Chris, how far does that extend? I mean, let's, our, our criminal justice system and our courts yeah. are designed to judge right. and they're designed to punish. And they don't and work. And there's a rapist <laughs> yeah. who clearly everyone disapproves of his or his conduct. Absolutely. How would a person with true nonviolent communications deal with that shadow of the rapist in the relationship and your natural aversion to that person's conduct. Well, it's a, it's a great example because Marshall talked about how he would be working with men who had sexually abused their daughters. Mm -hmm. And then they would say something uh, and he'd have them together to try to work through to help them understand and uh, you know, effectively change. And they would say something that would trigger him, you know, really callous or insensitive to their children. And then he'd say, 10 minute break, because he wanted to take, he wanted to kill them. Mm -hmm. But what he found was that the essence of the energy that they were reflecting, you know, like I haven't killed anybody, but I've been very angry, mm -hmm. right? So I go find the essence of that energy in myself and I look for where I have projected that onto others. And I can find that I've done harm too. Mm -hmm. I'm a human being. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's sometimes when I'm a jerk, there's sometimes I'm a nice guy. So in your business process development, right. climbing down off of a rapist, there right. can be a manager who is just obnoxious in the eyes of one or more employees. Somebody right. who just doesn't do things in an effective way and abuses people's confidence and yes. makes demands and so on. So you can have a group of people who all have that same shadow. How would you approach that sort of situation? Well, I tend to move towards shared needs in times of uh, working with, with companies and groups. And I can give you an example. Um, I was working with a, a minister who's working for a nonprofit, and she's working with end of life situations and counseling people who are dying. Mm. And she comes to me every once in a while and she said that her boss said, I want you to double the number of people you see in a week. And she was in despair because for her it's all about meaning and the people that she's supporting are, are there on their terms. It's not about her. Mm -hmm. She supports them until they make the shift, until they come into acceptance, until they let go of whatever is holding them so they can have a, a peaceful transition. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, what's the need of your boss? Well, the boss has a need for effectiveness and she needs statistics to go out and get uh, the money that's going to fund the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. the, the minister's need was meaning. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, let's hold both of these needs as sacred and let's come up with a strategy that supports both. Mm -hmm. Well, in her case, and like most of us, she couldn't see beyond her own needs. She saw that she'd have to give up her meaning in order to satisfy her boss. Mm -hmm. But I knew that there was another possibility. So, it's, so I said, well, let's play around with this for a minute. Is there a a, a time that you're meeting with families where it's really kind of a more of a general support around the, the death and transition of a family member and, and all these qualities that every family has in common about such an experience. And she mm -hmm. said, yes. I said, could you get four or five families in a room together at one time and that you can do that information discussion with all these people at the same time? She said, yes. Mm -hmm. I said, would that now leave you all the time you need to have the intimate time with the people who are dying as much as they need? She said, yes. Mm -hmm. So that solved the problem. But this is now a shared needs discussion about how do you make sure that uh, you're in being inclusive. You need people who are willing to sit and go through that process, who are willing to take the time and have the patience, the open-mindedness to engage? Not necessarily. You see, like I, I gave a public talk to um, 
a group of uh, uh, personnel managers, and mostly bankers. And at the end, I gave an empathy session. Mm -hmm. And uh, this woman, she brings a life wound into the conversation in front of all these bankers. It was really surprising, but she was wow. stuck. And, you know, most people would think, well, this is going to take a lot more time. It actually takes less. Mm -hmm. So in her case, she had a, a mother who, who had abandoned their family at five years old. Mom's still around, but they don't see her. And so this woman had become kind of the, the family mother at five years old for her younger siblings. Mm -hmm. And mom is still around, and mom now sends a Facebook friend request to one of the nieces. Uh -huh. So now she's, you know, really afraid that what's going on, and she's been hypervigilant and paying attention all her life. So we had a 10-minute conversation in front of these bankers. Mm -hmm. She walked all the way through it. She got to see that on the other side, she had been the one that had been the caretaker. Mm -hmm. And she'd always done a good job, and she would continue to make sure. So she just had to get connected with what was going on, and she was fine. What do you think it was about that occasion, that meeting, that gave her the confidence to bring that up? I mean, I'm sure she didn't wake up that morning saying, I'm going to go to this banker's conference, and I'm going to talk about this issue. Well, I think this because it was something that really had her by the throat. Yeah. And, you know, in but this something case... something uncorked it at that moment. What was that? Well, her ability to have a unrestricted and present connection with someone who could allow her to really wind her way through right. the whole thing. So you being the connection doctor, you were the one who gave her the permission to... Yeah, and the yeah. support. And yeah. she was surprised that she even brought it up. She was my backup empathy support. She's the vice president of this community, <laughs> okay? So it I'm was... sure a, everybody was surprised. Well, and then it was only a few of the men, because this is was mostly a women's organization. Uh -huh. The women all felt comfortable with the fact that they could be present for 10 minutes and walk through, and the men said, oh, we can't do that, it's not professional. Right. And I said, well, how much time did this take? Did she lose any work? Did she become unproductive? Mm -hmm. You know, now just to be present for 10 minutes, isn't this worth it? Yeah. But it's a new practice, you see. Yeah, it's accepting that being vulnerable and it's not being weak. Exactly. Yeah, right. that's a tough one for a lot of people to get past. It is. Yeah. And then, you know, but in the great teams and the great organizations, you know, the good to great model is the team is everything. So we have to have connection and really heartful support of yeah. life with our team members because when we do, they're much more likely to give their hearts and go beyond. If All right, Chris, let's put a pin in it right there. Right. We'll take a brief break, right. hear from some of the people who support this program, and we'll be right back with Chris Miller. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. We have this crazy thing going on today. I was just walking by and all these DJs and producers are set up all around the city. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? And they told me they were making music. back with Chris Miller. Now, during the break, Chris and I were talking, and you were beginning to say something more about this minister. Do you want to pick up that thought and complete it? Well, you know, there's some people that really have much more challenging lives. And that, uh, you know, if you think about someone who's ministering to the dying, I think that would be one of the harder things. Yeah. You know, or the social workers that are dealing with, you know, the impoverished or with the mentally ill or the people that are really suffering physically. Mm -hmm. So these people really need a lot of extra support in order to be able to succeed. As compared to, you know, we in business, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of different kinds of problems, but the needs are really the same. How do we start to identify our own self-care practices that maximize our abilities? And then how do we create community, especially in business? 
that is going to you know, be mindful and considerate because we're all going to have death in our families. We're all going to have mm -hmm. illness that we have to contend with. We all have these various challenges. And when we have the greatest amount of connection, then we have this great possibility of a much better life because who do we spend most of our time with? Mm -hmm. You know, the people we work with. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So if you can think back to yourself as a young boy, yeah. four, five, six, seven years old, yeah. maybe somewhere around in there, you might have come up with the idea that you would like to do this type of work. You might not have had a name to put to it, or it might have been later. Can you think back to um, the, the signal event or the time in your life when you realized this is what you wanted to be? You wanted to be Chris Miller, the connection guy. Well, I, I had a couple things, I think, in early life that really helped me immensely. Uh, one was I had a paper route that um, uh, gave me an ability to run a business, uh, 11 years old, and uh, three college scholarships, two trips to Disney World, and uh, uh, it gave me a chance to have a lot of connection with people in, you know, in various ways. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Boy Scouts were really fundamental for me. And, uh, and I ended up being an Eagle Scout and getting a lot of support there. So it was a, uh, both were fantastic for me. So that gave you a vision of who you might be able to be uh, as an effective person? Well, I, I think that my nature is to be heart-based. So I tend to follow what feels right. So you might say I've felt my way through life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, when it came to all the various things that uh, really have defined me. It's been about, well, what supports me? Mm -hmm. And that's actually how I, I was, uh, got better. I was at one point sick, uh, had what was called an incurable illness, and I got better mm -hmm. by feeling my way through it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, so, you know, really trusting my own spirit to guide me. Can you talk say. a little bit more about that? Sure, sure. Uh, I had a doctor tell me my life was over and that I needed to have other people take care of me and I, um, I did some radical transformation. I, uh, I gave up sugar, alcohol, caffeine, uh, became vegan and then I got such a clean you know, um, uh, body s system that I could feel everything. Mm -hmm. And then I started trying all these alternative uh, support systems and I found a, a collection of them that kind of led me to health and then mm -hmm. a miracle of healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was one of those techniques or paths that you explored in that time? Uh, well, actually one we, we brought to the forgiveness program, uh, Master Wong oh. uh, was one of my healers. I created a healing team. I only had one rule. I go out because I was so clean inside. I go try something and I tried anything mm -hmm. and if it felt good, I try it again. Mm -hmm. So I ended up with a collection of practices that all were very supportive of, of me. And Master Wong, um, 18th generation Qi Kung master, was one of those people that just was an exceptional healer. So I got to know the healing community very well. And, uh, and he was one of the people that helped me come to a, even a greater understanding of my inner life in that way. So he lives and works within the community here in Honolulu. Yes. yes. And most people may not know what Qigong is or who Master Wang is. He's a, he's a Tao philosopher and practitioner yeah. and healer. Um, talk to us a little bit about what that means to be, to be in the Tao, the, the fundamental of his life work view. Well, he is one that explains it as a function of energy. So I, for instance, took him to um, uh, a family friend's uh, uh, father who had a massive heart attack and uh, he said everyone said he was going to die and mm -hmm. he was in a coma for two weeks and the family finally um, after at the end because they were really uh, Christian of the variety that they didn't really trust these alternatives so much but after the doctor said he's not coming back they let me bring Master Wong a couple times uh -huh. and Master Wong just looks at everything as the, it's the energy too much or too little uh -huh. So if there's not enough energy, he adds energy. Uh -huh. If there's too much energy, he kind of frees it up to move. It's just moving energy. He moves it. He moves it. So after the second healing session, Master Wong said, he's going to be better. 
Mm -hmm. How would people find Master Wong here? Is it online? Is there a website? Well, he's see? mostly retired now, but um, you know, there's other people that do these kinds of things. Um, he is actually a lineage holder of the whole Taoist tradition. In fact, mm -hmm. I think your wife's going to meet him in shortly. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, you know, there are these exceptional people that give us new ways to, you know, work our way through things. And he was one that really helped me. So if people wanted to Google something, they could Google Master Wang, Dao, yes. Honolulu, yeah. and some links would come up. Yes, and I think he still offers classes occasionally. Uh. But, uh, you know, I, I ended up studying healing, and he was one of the people that has been a, a pivotal teacher after well, I, I got better. At the know. very corner of Chinese civilization, the yes. very root of Chinese civilization. And so much can be understood about China if you understand where that root comes from. Because everything that they're doing today is, a, is an expression of that fundamental philosophy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we've come to the end of our time together here. It seems like it was just a few minutes ago that mm -hmm. we started to talk. Do you have any final words that you can share with the audience about being an effective, peaceful person? Um, do what it takes to really give yourself the time and space to arrive with all the ones you really love the most, with your heart open enough that you can really uh, be with them. So notice what you're holding and how much you're holding. And so if you're, if you rate, I rate myself on a scale of one to ten, all the, all through the day. Mm -hmm. And if I get to be at a six, I stop everything and clear myself. So I noticed that for years I thought six was a one. <laughs> Because <laughs> I was so full all the time. So now before I arrive with, to those that I really care about most, I have practices that I release. So I, my heart is really able to be present with them and offer you know, the real care and love and attention that I want to share with them. That's tremendous. Yeah. Thank you so much, Chris. Thanks, Michael. Good to spend time with you. Yeah. And we'll be back again soon with another episode of The Art of Thinking Smart. Aloha.